Hi, I'm Graham Glick, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching and Learning Plus Technology at Stony Brook University, and this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches to teaching and applications of educational technology that have had a positive effect on student learning. In this show, I'm joined by two guests, this Dick Laskowski, who is a professor in the College of Business, and Bob Bettel, who's also in the College of Business as the director of the Executive MBA program. Dick and Bob, welcome to the show. Thanks, Graham. Good Thank to see you. you. Bob, Thank tell you. me a little bit about what you teach and the setting in which you teach it. Yeah, I teach in both the, uh, the graduate and the undergraduate levels. And uh, my concentration area is in marketing, sales, and sales management, and in business strategy. Okay. The, uh, the undergraduate classes, you mentioned the size of the classes before, they cap out at about 60 or so, and it's usually because the classroom was full. Okay. And the, in the past, I used to teach the business in the 21st century course, which I, I helped coordinate with Dick. And what, Dick, we could have anywhere 180 to 200 yep. students mm -hmm. in those classes, the large lectures. Okay. And Dick? And uh, I teach the un uh, in the undergraduate program, I teach the introductory course for all uh, business majors, and it's limited to 36 because of the intensive writing that we do in the class. And as Bob mentioned, I teach the um, uh, introduction to business in the 21st century for non-business majors, where we have about 200, and I teach a sports management uh, class that has 60 in it. Okay, now you also, I believe, do some blended learning. And I do a synchronous online course during the winter session. Okay. So we're going to be talking about storytelling and socialization to connect mm -hmm. with the students. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how you guys use storytelling in the classroom. I love to use storytelling. I'm, one of the things I tried to build into my classroom experience is two things. One, I go back to what I hated about going to school. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in school, like many educators, and I made a list of the things that I found difficult, that hindered my ability to learn. And so I want to take those things out and I want to reinforce the things that helped me to learn. And one of the things I found that worked very well was if you give the students facts, and you give them all the detail, first of all, you're going to lose half of them in the class with that kind of a routine to begin with. But if you just give them the straight facts, there's no application. Mm -hmm. they, can't make the, uh, they can't make the association and then integrate it with their other courses. So by giving them stories and to explaining to them how we've used this information in the real world, in the business environment, and where it's worked and where it hasn't worked, and especially when we've screwed up and made mistakes, the students really like that, then they can relate to what we're talking about and see an application that says, now I know how it works and what I'm supposed to do with it. So give me an example of your favorite story. Yeah, one of my favorite stories is Captain Crunch. I worked on Captain Crunch when we reintroduced Captain Crunch, the, uh, the cereal. And we did a whole lot of focus groups with youngsters to find out whether or not the children liked the potential for another new flavor and things like that. And the youngster was uh, telling us how much he loved the cereal. But when we did the videotaping of the uh, focus groups, the kid was taking a bite of the cereal and he was looking for a place to spit it out. Yeah, he was trying to find a cup, a napkin, anything he can have. So when you talk to the kids about how a, a focus group is used, now they can relate and they can all see this little seven-year-old kid sitting there mm -hmm. trying to find a way to discreetly get rid of a mouthful of cereal. Okay, and Dick, your favorite And story? I do the same thing. Uh, I, I love the story groups. Now, if it's sports management, because I was in college athletics uh, in every aspect of it for 29 years, I can stop the topic right there and then relate to it. And uh, in business, it's, it's the same thing because when I came here, my charge from the president was to build a big time athletics program. So I was an entrepreneur in many ways. Mm -hmm. And how I stopped the class from time to time and explained to them how you build a program, who are your customers and competitors, how technology plays a role in that, uh, going overseas, globalization. So that's what it's all about. As Bob pointed out, the textbook is a little bit of a prop. Mm -hmm. And you stop it and then you, you bring the true to life stories, which are much more interesting to a student than reading something out of a textbook because they can now relate to it because you have done it. And your favorite story? 
Uh, my favorite story is a very good friend of mine began a restaurant and um, was an entrepreneur and in the course of five years had built three restaurants and was a, was a millionaire by the time he was 30. And, and I was part of that whole group of starting the restaurant with him and taking it up to the point where I worked in a restaurant as a bartender. Mm -hmm. And I tell them all about how this was done and how you could be a successful businessman if you do A to Z as he did. Okay. Props and dressing up in costumes. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I do that. Uh, for my online course, look, we have to realize something. Students today are very different. Uh, he's a master at, at the lecture where he could bring in his stories. Today, kids are so high tech, you really have to entertain them. And as I say, walk past somebody's classroom and most kids are looking down and their fingers are moving on that. Mm -hmm. So how do you entertain them? You bring them, you bring your classroom into today's technology. So the first thing I do is um, I teach from Costa Rica, by the way, which is, which is really nice, back to the United States, and I, I dress up in some costume to start the program. They have to guess who I am. And, um, this is in a video conference. Yeah, this is it, and uh, one of my favorite is that they usually don't get that I am Tiger Woods' long lost brother because I dress in the golf cap and uh, the Nike and the Nike red shirt, and I have the golf club there, but they can't figure it out until I tell them that. And then I go into the, the weather forecast, since they're all over the country, and I'm the last one to report that the temperature, again, is 92 degrees, the sun is shining, and the water temperature is 84. Are you having fun back home? It you is know, freezing so do, back here. Yeah, yeah, different things like that. Okay. So you have to engage them. This is what it's all about. To me, teaching so is just, almost... You're just using this to make the class more fun. It's not yeah. necessarily... The costumes are not related to no, the content of no. the class. Teaching is theater. Mm -hmm. Our job is to present a curriculum and I always say, when you walk in a course and they have written on their heads, entertain us today with a lesson, make us learn and make us have fun doing it. And that's the philosophy you have to do. How do you engage them? How do you make your lesson interesting? Any type of prop that works, use it. Mm -hmm. right. How important is it for students to get to know you and the rest of the class? Socialization. Do you want to start that one? Yeah, I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, some of the stories that I use and the examples I give in class are some of my own personal examples. Uh, for example, we just completed a lecture the other day on quality circles for total quality management. And I built in a specific example of explaining how one of my brothers did it in a business environment, and he's not a businessman. I mean, he just walked into it and was able to make a contribution to a, uh, <coughs> to a company he worked with. And the students then get a sense of something about me other than I'm just some professor standing in the front of the classroom. Okay. I've got a brother, I've got kids, I can relate to them, I've got children a little, little older than they are. So I want them to then tell me about their examples. Because one of the things I ask them to do is to come up with their own stories. And every week they have to turn in an what we call an applications paper, where they have to take any one of the principles or the sub-principles that we talked about in class, and they have to go out and find their own example of it, and then explain where it worked and it didn't work. And to Are they primarily doing that on the internet? Uh, yes, yeah, and, and, and they've got to be cautioned about the information they get on the right. internet too, yeah. Most of them do it, but one of the things I encourage with them is to give me personal examples. Mm -hmm. And they'll go out and they'll say, well, I was in a store and I experienced this, or my dad was talking about this at dinner last weekend. And you get to know more about the students and what they're doing and what they're doing outside of class, and then they get to know something about me without going into my personal life to the point where, you know, I don't want them to go there. But uh, the socialization process is, I find that they, they start to trust each other a little bit more, and they trust me. Okay. They start saying things in class or putting things in the paper that, upon occasion, I've had to write on the paper, this is not an ethical issue, you're breaking the law mm -hmm. yeah, when you're doing this kind of thing. So the socialization gives us an opportunity to open up a little bit and to understand that, hey, we're just a bunch of people sitting around talking. Right. I, I, don't like to, I, I don't like to view my class as a teaching environment. I like to think of it as we're just going to sit around, we're going to talk about the material, we're going to give a bunch of stories and explain how it all comes together and how it's all integrated, and gosh, we can do that in your living room too. What do you do to make them feel safe to you know, expose that type of information to each other? Well, I tell them right up front, anything they ever say to me doesn't ever leave me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go anywhere. I'm not going to call a sheriff's office or something or anything like that. And I think when I explain to them how I'm vulnerable, and I made decisions and I made mistakes and things got all screwed up, I think they feel a little bit more comfortable and they feel more safe about saying, well, I did something and I don't, I don't think it was done correctly either. Mm -hmm. okay. Icebreakers. 
And do you use them to help the students get to get to know one yeah, another? Yeah, I use them a lot. And let's go back to what you were just discussing with Bob of getting to know you, the uh, the person in front of the classroom. I always think I also think it's important that they get to know the people that they're working with because mm -hmm. we do a lot of group work in every class. Uh, so one of the icebreakers I ask them to do, I put them together, and, and I usually have four of them. I say, tell the other members of the group something about you that most people don't know. Uh, or else there might be one I say, uh, pick a person, either living or deceased, that if you had the opportunity to come back as, who would you want to be? Mm -hmm. Or another one I say, uh, choose three people you'd like to have dinner with, and why did you choose those people? And again, it, it gets them to feel comfortable about themselves, but then I'll also come into it and they'll say, well, what don't we know about you or that a lot of people don't know? And I say, you know, I've, I've been in sports for 29 years. Most people don't know that I love the opera and I have season tickets to the opera. And they sit back and they say, wow, you know, that's something we never would have imagined. So that's how you sort of break the ice, not only with them as a group among themselves, but also with you. And going back to sports management, uh, very often uh, we do test cases of what I did as a dean over uh, 10 years here and situations that I was involved in and I have them make a decision as to how they would have resolved it then I tell them how I resolved it so they become uh, much more knowledgeable of what I'm like as a person. Now do you just do this at the beginning of the course or do you do it throughout the course? Now, I do it throughout the course we'll come up with something to again what are we doing to make them interested in the class so that they're learning something. If you don't have their interest, no matter how good you are, your, your, um, your knowledge of the subject, they're not, they're not going to get it. Mm -hmm. It's a different student. Okay. I so try to get them involved in a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, the first class, I have them take out the syllabus and we, we go through the syllabus and all. And then I tell them there's something missing in the syllabus and they've got to write it in. And I tell them to write down at the bottom of the second page, world's worst jokes. And then I'll tell them one of the world's worst jokes. I have a very corny sense of humor. <laughs> and I'll tell them a really dumb joke. And I'm telling them, if you're going to take my course, you have to anticipate that you're going to have to tell me some jokes, too. Mm -hmm. So kind of break and the ice with them a little bit. Part of the syllabus, is it required that they laugh? <laughs> <laughs> I tell them their grade depends on it, but it's not in the syllabus. Okay. <laughs> you don't laugh, hmm, it's not going right. to go down well. <laughs> so, Dick, uh, initially you were sort of a little reluctant to use technology. No, no. That's great. That's not true. I was very reluctant. Very reluctant. <laughs> I refused okay. to do it. And, and now you're using it but quite I'm a bit. But I'm also a prag pragmatist. I look around at these students, as I said, they're very, very different today. They're all the H HDHD because I was, I, I'm that. I, it's very difficult to maintain their attention for a long period of time. Now, he's the master of giving a lecture and keeping them involved. I think most of us today are not that good, so we have to move into their technology, whatever that, that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember growing up, one of my best friends who was a terrible student in rock and roll years, he said, if they could ever put lessons to rock and roll music, I'd be an A student. And I look at that today. How can we use today's technology? And just through a stroke of luck, I, I, you know, that's all they're doing. They're texting. And I said, how can we incorporate this device that I abhor into the classroom? And the assignment the other day was his specialty, was marketing. And uh, in the textbook, there are six different ways to price out your products. Well, I found something on the web that said there were 18. 18. So I had them bring in their textbooks, and they could only find six. I said, now it's up to you. Use innovation. Find the other 12. And they kept looking at me and looking at me. I said, come on, you have it right on you. And sure enough, they went to their, their cell phone. They Googled it, mm -hmm. and they found the answers. You know? But like I said, it was just a stroke of luck. If we could get lessons somehow through cell phones we're going to have them involved all the time and so what other technologies do you use well what i do on my uh, uh on that online is that i'll use very basic because i'm not that comfortable with everything but certainly they can raise their hand we have uh conversations among ourselves into groups but i like to use powerpoint and I'll throw the slide up, and then again, we'll just see the slide, and then we'll talk about uh, everyday life. How does this relate to you? How does this relate to me? So, so as a person who was highly reluctant to use technology, how did you get over that? How, what got you through that to the point where you were comfortable using it? Am I very comfortable with it? No. But I believe that it is the future. Mm -hmm. And if we're not doing it, we're going to lose the students. 
and that's what it's all about. If we don't have customers, and I consider students customers because we're in business, oh, we're out of business. They pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to go into their, uh, their lifestyle now, and their mm -hmm. lifestyle's tech. But did you just do this on your own? Well, no, of course, I had Nancy to help me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Your department. Okay. I could not do this on my own. I had Dick to help me, yeah. so you know what kind of trouble I'm in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's Blind it, leading the blind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a fast learner with technology, but I realize the importance of it, and I have to do it, and I have to become better at it. Okay. It, ta it takes work, oh, it, yes. and it takes practice. I, I was able to participate in one online course, and I know I'm in the office right next door to Dick, and he can attest to this. I was panic stricken. I mean, the thought of getting up there on my own at night, there was nobody around, it was a night class, mm -hmm. and I had to do this thing. Uh, great amount of difficulty and reluctance on my part, and I just went with the most simplistic version that I could get away with, is the way I viewed it. And my experience with it was, I understand what Dick is saying, it is a wave of the future in the classroom to supplement the teaching not to replace the teaching. It's not about the technology, it's about the teaching. Right. It's a tool. And, it, and it's just another tool. Mm -hmm. But if we're not comfortable with the tool, then it definitely interferes with the teaching. So my experience was I had a couple of technical problems and I actually told the students to call me on the phone if they had something that we couldn't get straightened out just talking to the uh, monitor on the computer. And I understand technologically I was not supposed to do that, but the students did call up and they'd actually talk to me while we were online. So. I'm still not comfortable with it, but I recognize that there's a, uh, there's a place for it mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the, in the I mean, teaching I mean, world. Essentially, when you look at any technology we use in teaching, it's just a communication tool. It's That's another it route to. of yeah. getting interaction and information to yeah. and from the students. Let me give you another example. Trying to explain to students the financial crisis and what caused it with the banks and the meltdowns and everything like that. I, I know it pretty well, but I could see when I'm teaching them, they're not getting it. Yeah. And I found a cartoon, literally, on YouTube mm -hmm. that explained it so well. It's a seven minute. I sat there and I said, this has to be it. And I threw it up for them and they just sat there. They were awed by it and they understood it perfectly. So that's the technology. Mm -hmm. what, else, what, what is out there today, we have to make use of. And it's amazing what you can find out there. Resources developed by other faculty, by mm -hmm. people in business and so on. Mm -hmm. Freely available for you to use and, and, and enrich your class with. It's yeah. amazing. With, with the caveat that you check your sources. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, mean, I tell the students that when I did a paper when I was an undergraduate and my professor pulled me aside and he said, Edel, let me tell you something. Just because it's written down doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, today you say to the students, just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's true. Absolutely. Yeah, see, and you got to do your homework. One other, we, we cover current events in all of these classes, in the business courses. So what I do is I tune into uh, Yahoo Finance. And we're getting the latest as the class is going on. They say, explain this story to me. What does this mean? What is the price of gold rising versus the, the dollar declining? What's the relationship? And it makes them think, and they like it because they now see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dick and Bob, thank you very much for being on the show. It was our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. If you have any questions for our guests, you can visit the TLT website at tlt.stonybrook.edu or visit our fan site on Facebook. Just search for Innovations in Education. I'm Graham Glynn. I hope you join me for the next interesting show of Innovations in Education. Thank you.